All right, well, I think we are up and running. Um, so I would like to say good morning, everyone, a warm welcome uh, to our SAS Transdisciplinary Seminar Series. Uh, we are so thrilled this morning to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Hotbod um, from Michigan State University. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that there's been a lot of interest in your talk and it's such a timely and important topic. Um, before I hand it over, I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr. Hodbaud a little bit more formally. Um, so Jennifer is an assistant professor in the Department of Community Sustainability at Michigan State University, where she researches and teaches the topic of resilient food systems, which she defines as environmentally and economically sustainable food systems that can equitably feed a growing global population whilst adapting to security threats such as climate change, changing preferences and economic shocks. To integrate these components, she use, utilizes environmental social science and political ecology methods within a novel and integrative research design for investigating human environment interactions, uh, and, or also known as resilience assessment. Her collaborators include very much uh, in keeping with the transdisciplinary nature of this seminar series, her collaborators include members of key research and engagement organizations, academics from multiple disciplines and universities, local and national governments, NGOs, and smallholder and commercial uh, producers. So we're th so thrilled to have you here this morning. Uh, warm welcome, and I will hand the floor over. Okay, let me share my screen. And does that look It's ready? perfect, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, like just said, I'm going to talk about kind of how sustainability, equity and resilience fit together in my work um, researching food systems. And when I was thinking about today, there was two directions I could have gone in, one more theoretical and one more practical. And I'm hoping that I've not bitten off more than I can chew, fun, food, pun intended, but I'm going to try and do both because 40 minutes I think is okay. So. Um, this might kind of start, uh, if, the, if there's pieces of theory that, you know, um, need clarifying, please feel free to, to let me know and I will happily do that in the Q&A afterwards. So to start with the theory, um, I'm very much a resilience scholar. I am um, an environmental social scientist broadly. I've been working with resilience theory since my PhD through my postdoc to kind of the current day. And I'm very much coming from the social ecological resilience um, world, particularly kind of in and around the Resilience Alliance kind of um, literature on resilience. So the, I like to start with a definition so we all kind of know where we're coming from. And the defin definition of resilience that I'm using is, is really kind of evolved from that literature. So resilience is the capacity of a system to respond to change through adaptation or transformation while maintaining structure, function and identity, but also continuing to develop, i.e. supporting positive and proactive change. And so I'll kind of try and explain that a little that um, really what we're talking about here is that there are these um, different ways we can respond to change, some of which kind of are more short term reactive responses that we might call coping. They require less resources. We can do them without a ton of planning. Some of them are more long term proactive responses which takes you into the realm of transformation where you're very much creating intentional change. And underlying which of these responses we, are, we uh, make when faced with change are the kind of principles of resilience, which are summarized in um, the Biggs et al book, which shows the seven principles of resilience. And I can talk about those later if we need, but things to do with like diversity, participation, et cetera. And what I like about this kind of overarching framing is that it helps the principles help us understand how resilience is demonstrated or not. So one of the things that when you start to bring transformation into resilience theories, it can get a little confusing, but hopefully it, we can kind of say up front that, you know, a system can be an SES is shorthand for social ecological system here. You know, a system is resilient if it can persist or adapt through this change to maintain identity, which brings you to this kind of coping adaptation sphere, or it can be resilient if it intentionally changes or transforms to support a new identity. But we talk about a system not being resilient if it has these kind of unintentional effects in identity because of a change, and that indicates a lack of resilience. So what I'm looking at in food systems is, is kind of the spectrum of change 
uh, the spectrum of responses to change that we cope with because we do have some systems that we want to intentionally change as well as ones that we want to kind of see persevere um, but be able to cope with climate change and, stu and such. So if we try and bring that together with well-being and sustainability, um, in general, sustainability is focused on kind of increasing the quality of life, which is where I bring in this concept of well-being. So we want to think about that in a holistic way with environmental, social and economic considerations. And we want to think about it in an intergenerational, intergenerational way. So we want to maintain well-being for both current and future generations. And so we have this kind of um, starting point in my work where well-being outcomes, and they should be covering kind of environmental, social and economic considerations, are indicators of sustainability. And really sustainability kind of then becomes how are you able to maintain well-being over time, if not increase it over time. But to be able to support this, this well-being over time, we also need to bring in ideas of resilience. And that's bringing in this piece about, you know, our systems are dynamic, they're interrelated, they're nested within larger systems. And so there's going to be all of these types of shocks that hit the food system or the general social ecological system we are interested in. So how do you then maintain, maintain well-being through these shocks and over time? And what a resilience lens offers us is a way to think about, you know, is this system providing well-being in a way that we want to see persevere, in which case we need to think about how to boost adaptive capacity so that you can maintain the system's structure, function or identity. Or is this a system that isn't achieving well-being goals and thus sustainable, in which case we need to boost our transformative capacity and intentionally try and boost well-being and create a new kind of system regime that has higher levels of well-being. And for me, this is where equity stems in the, from these initial well-being considerations. And I wish I had cleverer graphics to try and show you this. But um, in reality, particularly in our food systems, such a range of actors are involved in them. And there's such diversity even within a group such as a community that we can't think about well-being being static and, and the same for everybody. We need to incorporate these ideas of diversity and that different people are experiencing well-being in different ways. And some people may need different um, levels of support to get them to, to a, you know, an optimal level of food security or such to support their well-being. So equity then stems through this initial idea of well-being to thinking about how we create a sustainable system to, and also a resilient food system. And then this is a figure from a paper by, by Marchese et al. And, and I will give some caveats to it afterwards, but I think it actually explains some of these ideas pretty well in that what you can see here is this idea of sustainability being this level of well-being over time, right? Um, and so I can, I've kind of annotated here, say, look, you've got well-being at time one before some kind of disturbance. The disturbance creates a drop in well-being. And then the, in a more resilient system shown by the blue line, your well-being has actually improved after this disturbance. And this is a way of demonstrating how kind of resilience can help us maintain well-being through shocks while supporting kind of sustainability. Um, the caveat I offer with this figure is that um, A, it's not really including equity, right? So there isn't just going to be one, one line of well-being within a system. There's going to be multiple different people and groups experiencing well-being in different ways. And the other is that these are all multi-dimensional ideas and they really can't be represented by one indicator or metric. So well-being includes multiple different components, as I'll talk about later. And by mapping it on a graph like this, um, there is always a risk that this this reflects more an idea of engineering resilience you know it's just the kind of capacity to respond over time and i do want to be very clear that this is a useful way of explaining this concept quite quickly but it's much more complex than shown on this kind of one graph and the literature has really evolved over the last 50 years to kind of move away from this idea of resilience as a rate or how long it takes to bounce back and this is what we now call resiliency or engineering resilience and what the kind of um, social ecological systems literature has shown us by talking about resilience it, is that resilience is a systems property. So it's an idea that's blending ideas from complexity theory, ecology and the social sciences to really talk about um, regimes and, and how kind of um, a social ecological system can exist in multiple regimes. And those will have certain characteristics of which resilience is one. 
these ideas were critiqued quite a lot in the kind of late 2000s by the social sciences and this is where equity becomes uh, more kind of important because the idea is that within that kind of system you'll have these multiple actors and they will experience resilience differently as well which means we start to need to start integrating ideas of power and equity and we move from this question to operationalize these ideas of resilience of what to what to a broader resilience of what to what for whom to try and understand that differentiation. So when we start thinking about this with respect to food systems, I've mentioned structure, function and identity a lot. There are many uh, different kind of conceptual diagrams of food systems and they are all inevitably quite complex because food systems are complex. But this one I really like, it's from Ericsson um, and the work with the GCAS project back in 2008. And what it demonstrates is that this food system on the right um, you know, has a series of activities that go all the way from production to consumption that leads to a series of outcomes. The main outcome of a food system should be food security, but there's obviously other social and environmental outcomes as well. And then that our food systems exist nested within our broader social ecological systems. So you see there's two way arrows here, both coming into the food system, going out of the food system to interact with the environment and with our broader um, societies and economies. And so when we start to talk about structure, this kind of gives us a framing to start thinking about well, what are the components of our food system and how are they connected? The functions that we have here, which are generally the processes or roles carried out by humans in the system, um, but could well be ecosystem functions as well. You know, in this space are probably the activities. Um, so what are we what are we expecting out of our food system? Well, production of food is always going to be a primary function, but but not every scale of food system does that itself, right? If you think about an urban food system, you might have a, a, a spatial kind of um, two systems that are connected with food coming from a rural area into an urban. So that might be more that distribution is an important function for an urban food system. And then you lead to this kind of food security piece, um, which often is one of the characteristics that can help uh, provide the identity of a food system. Is this, you know, a, um, so is this a rural or an urban food system based around production or consumption? What do the levels of food security look like for who, et cetera? So there's a few kind of, um, I, I think you guys have read um, the paper I wrote with Hallie Eakin. So this is kind of summarizing some of those lessons, but the reason that I think food systems need a pretty specific focus, uh, different to the general social ecological systems literature, is that they are human design systems for a human goal and therefore can be quite different to other types of social ecological systems because they're fundamentally normative. We have you know, goals and things we see as being good and bad in our food systems that are really important for our survival. And what we've tended to have done in the past 100 years at least is manage these systems for only two functions, productivity, i.e. producing the most food we can, and profit, then making a profit off that production. And that means that we've really adjusted the system structure and created this increasingly connected and globalized system to achieve those functions, which now, because of those feedbacks to the environment and to society, we see you know, implications for greenhouse gas emissions from the food system, for deforestation, for water quality, et cetera. Um, through that, we have managed to keep producing food and to keep feeding people. So one of the kind of interesting things we're thinking about in food systems is this idea of coerced resilience, that these, these systems are now able to deal with shocks. You know, COVID has had multiple impacts on supply chains, but, but we tend to be able to come back to the state we were before. But this isn't necessarily the kind of natural form of resilience. It's pretty coerced. And I can talk about this in the Q&A, but um, there's some really great work coming out of um, Nebraska with Craig Allen's group and um, David Engler and Dirac Twidwell et al. kind of talking about coerced resilience. So this is a system that is resilient, but not necessarily in a desirable way, because often what we're still failing to achieve is the primary goal. We are not feeding everybody to the appropriate level. And we still have relatively high levels of food security, insecurity. So that leads to two main kind of discussions thinking about the resilience of food systems. One is that we really need to embed this kind of equity dynamic and understand for the most marginalized groups who don't have, uh, who haven't achieved food security, why that is and how we can um, uh, understand that balance better. And then think about the role of resilience as transformation to try and bring those up and kind of address those inequities. 
So um, resilience has actually become a really popular buzzword, if nothing else, in kind of the management of food systems, particularly with COVID, because there really is an awareness now with climate change and with things like COVID and such and economic shocks that we have to think about how to support the capacity of our food systems to respond to change, but they also need to continue to develop. And therefore, I think we're at a really interesting time to try and embed um, this power and equity theory within resilience theory, particularly for food systems. So I've said most of that. So the way I have been doing that, as um, mentioned at the beginning, is by integrating in some ideas of political ecology. And this helps us understand kind of to start off with how power dynamics affect the structure of our food systems. So this is about mapping out the social relationships and kind of anticipating that there's an asymmetrical distribution of resources and therefore risk. Um, and that even if you're mostly interested in the production of food at an ecological level, you can't understand that without understanding the political and economic structures of which that food production is embedded. And then to me, power is the kind of high level thing determining structure and equity is the outcome of those structures. So there's a phrase called distributive justice, which I quite think fits really well, that, that this is where um, it's really about how outcomes are distributed across a group. And, and I personally use well-being outcomes to try and explain that. So what's interesting is that the literature tends to either focus on power or equity. And in the kind of political and social, social sociological sciences, you see more about power dynamics and international development and education, you see more about equity outcomes. And I'm finding it interesting and useful to actually integrate both. And so um, what's interesting is this is quite a small area of the literature for now, but I'm working on a lit review to try and demonstrate a how little we know about this and how we how little we integrate these ideas and then come up with a framework for moving forward, which is what you're getting a taster of today, basically. So this is a picture of a social ecological system. Um, you can see in here that the pieces that were kind of influence structure um, and are kind of influenced by power dynamics are in here. So you've got the different practices, institutions, etc. And normally we think about this kind of social interactions um, as society being made up of multiple groups with multiple different experiences. And in the literature, there's quite a few papers about 35 who point out that we need to talk about power and equity within resilient studies and often point this out as a critique, like I said, in the timeline. Um, and this really has helped us develop this idea of why we need to talk about resilience for whom, because there will be different equity outcomes for all of these folks on the right. However, when you start to actually operationalize that, the majority of studies who are actually collecting data and looking at resilience for whom in practice, do it for just one group. So they're studying the impacts of a shock on one group within society. But communities are not kind of one cohesive group. So what this approach, whilst really valuable and a good starting point, is it's, it's missing those equity dynamics, which you need to have a view across a society to understand, and often missing the most marginalized groups in the analysis. So I think that to ensure we can actually strengthen resilience of our food systems for diverse actors in a system, we need to kind of broaden that focus. And there's actually very few papers who've done this and most of them have been in fishing systems. So there's a real gap for this in the food systems literature. Um, and that's important both for helping us understand the theory, but also the practice, right? How do we actually manage our food systems to boost well-being and resilience, particularly of the most marginalized? So that's the big question. How do we do this? And that's what the second half of my talk is on, the operationalization of these ideas in food systems. One caveat I'm going to give you in advance is that this is complicated work that requires kind of long term projects often and participatory approaches so you can engage with stakeholders. So I will um, present here the big picture, but often we don't do all of this in one project. It depends on exactly what the focus is in the food system we're interested in. But um, given that I told you, you know, I've been involved with the Resilience Alliance for since I was a grad student. And so I've kind of adapted a lot of their um, existing tools for resilience assessment. Um, what they would say is, you know, similar to this idea of resilience being a systems property, there isn't an explicit kind of measure of resilience or an explicit methodology for resilience assessment. Instead, what we're looking at is a context specific case study based approach that's interdisciplinary and involving multiple forms of knowledge um, and also hopefully participatory so that you're involving multiple different stakeholders 
intentionally those who are managing the system that you're interested in. And the whole point of this is that it's a loop system so that you can start really anywhere in the system that's of interest to the stakeholders and use it to inform a management plan that you then use an adaptive management approach so you continue to collect data throughout any changes you make to see how it's affecting the resilience of the system. So I just want to be really clear that you do not get a measure of resilience out of this. There's not a score because by having that kind of measuring approach, you often miss the kind of broader system dynamics that are really important when we think about food systems or any type of social ecological system. So what I've done over the past 10 years now is create a multitude of different tools to use to get through these three different phases, which could all be boiled down basically about understanding the past to think about the future. And I'm uh, the, the longer I'm in this job, the more qualitative I appear to become. So whilst we do have quantitative data sets involved in this, often they're stitched together in a more qualitative way. And it's the qualitative data that becomes really important for actually understanding the components of the system that are eroding or enhancing resilience and the kind of actions, um, be it coping, adaptation, transformation that are being used. So if we go back to that guiding question of resilience of what, to what, for whom, resilience of what is really kind of um, understood by helping conceptualize the system. So firstly, that's pretty standard, like what food system are you interested in and what are the relevant scales? So by scales, I mean in space, in time, and then thinking about levels of governance that are involved. So for example, I've used this approach to look at river basin development in Ethiopia, which is a pretty big spatial scale, but the temporal scale was pretty short because the dam was installed in 2015. So we're really looking at like 2014 through the present day. We've also looked at this in urban food systems in Flint, Michigan, which is a city. So that gives you a kind of more honed in spatial scale, but actually our temporal scale was much longer because to understand when Flint was really thriving, we had to go back multiple decades. And that gives you kind of city level governance, but also how the city fits within um, state and federal governance as well. Then you want to you know, go back to this kind of core components of the food system that you can use to help identify structure, function and identity. You can use the kind of um, model, conceptual model of a social ecological system to help inform this, but it will sort of depend on whether you're looking at a rural system or an urban system, how interested you are in the ecosystem and the ecosystem services. But in all of my work, what's most crucial is mapping out the actors in the system and the key activities that they are doing to then look at the food system outcomes. So often this starts with a period of scoping for both stage one and two here. And then we look at resource mapping on a more ecological side and then stakeholder mapping on a more social side. So to give you some deeper context there, um, scoping really is just trying to work out what scales you're interested in and what co components you and your kind of fellow stakeholders are interested in. This is some pictures from a scoping trip in Ethiopia where we thought we were there to think about the dam, but in doing scoping trips, which was kind of involved transect walks and understanding what the food system looked like, we discovered it was not the only shock that communities were dealing with. And this shows the impact of the fall army worm, which was also coming through. So we, we weren't able to separate out those two shocks, particularly the two kind of intersected and that informed how we set up our analysis moving forwards. But this is all about building familiarity with the system and building trust with key, key stakeholders in the area as well. Um, in the Ethiopia case study, and I think this is this is another paper that you've read, we then did have a particular focus on ecosystem components and ecosystem services. So we did a lot of participatory resource mapping to understand what actions were taking place, you know, where were crops being produced, where were animals being grazed, where were wild foods being collected from, and how that had changed over time, pre and post uh, the dam in particular. Um, which then helped us understand more so than just looking at remote sensing data of vegetation in itself or other types of ecosystem service data, what was important to local communities and what was changing from an access and an availability perspective. Um, in my urban work, it tends to be that we don't do as much resource mapping, obviously, because there isn't as much production of food in the system of, of focus. So instead we do a lot more work on stakeholder mapping. And again, this is done in collaboration with key stakeholders and in a participatory way. And what we're trying to do is understand who is in the food system and how are they connected by what types of uh, relationships. So um, this also helps us start those conversations about power dynamics, 
But from a practical level, it means from a research design perspective, we know we're talking to the right people um, and that we involve them in our data collection. So usually I'm a big fan of a post-it note. Nothing I do is super complicated methods wise. So it's about using post-it notes to list the different groups. Um, yellow ones in this context are within Flint, blue or outside of Flint. And then thinking about primarily the flow of food through these organizations. But what we've also got here is the flow of finances and information um, to help build out that picture of how different actors are related across scales. You can then get really clever with it and digitize it in software like Kumu and start to look at structure more quantitatively, looking at measures of complexity and such. But um, we tend to find that actually it's the qualitative data from those discussions and the mapping activities that's most um, useful. But what this does is give us a list of stakeholders that then informs our resilience for whom that we can use to think about who has access to what types of resources and how their well-being outcomes are as well. So then we get to the, OK, we've got a good picture of our system at this point. We know who's in it. We know what access to what resources they have. But now we want to look at usually we're looking backwards at a particular shock. Um, sometimes you might be interested in a specific shock. Sometimes it might be more the pattern of shocks. But we do timelining to start off with, which helps us map out those patterns in itself and understand whether they're coming from within the system or outside of the system. Then that gives us a basis to, to build on to look at how different groups have been affected by those shocks. Um, and that's where the well-being data really becomes really important. But also this is mostly collected through surveys and interviews, and that gives us a chance to really dig in more deeply to say, well, was this response coping, adaptation, transformation, et cetera, and which resilience principles were supporting those choices? And then the final piece is particularly if you're looking to, if you're in a system that doesn't have um, either equitable levels of well-being or isn't responding to shocks in a desirable way, we include this piece about visioning, which should say number seven, sorry, um, and thinking about what desirable futures look like and how to, um, who, who needs what boosting, basically. And then the idea is this will go back into kind of some actions that will change the system slightly and then you need to reconceptualize it again in your understanding. So timelining is something we have our first paper in review about this and actually it's been super useful. We've done it in all of our projects, but often it's more of a kind of boundary object. It's not data collection in itself. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's usually a long piece of paper with a line on it and folks are kind of encouraged to put events that they think are important um, along the line and we use different colored post-it notes for things that are, you know within the food system outside of the food system uh, positive negative etc and this is just a kind of facilitated conversation and then using that as a prompt of which of these had the most effect and why who was affected most or least and why um, like i said we then go into more of the well-being metrics to try and understand the impact of those events of those shocks and as we saw earlier with this graph on the right you know we said that this is a multi-dimensional um factor and the marchese paper really recognizes that and talks about how you would combine multiple different metrics into this one measure of sort of well-being or and thus sustainability we take a similar approach but it, this just isn't the only data we use so um for example in our food systems work on farms in particular we really want to include ideas of ecological well-being. So that comes down to things like soil health, animal health and grazing systems, ecosystem services generally, that then gets combined with multiple forms of social well-being and economic well-being. We've been doing a lot of work kind of pulling from the literature um, about psychological well-being and what social psychology can offer in terms of you know, metrics for life satisfaction and how people's values are being um, met, etc as well as the more traditional ideas of material well-being, which is that if you have certain assets, you must be well. What we know is that that's not necessarily the case, right? Just being richer doesn't make you happier. So we're really trying to embed these ideas of, of a more holistic approach to well-being, but also multiple scales, because we know that, you, you know, the social networks you're part of and the communities you're part of are really important for your well-being. So this becomes a bit of a black box depending on the context we're in but the good news is there's lots of overlap here with indicators of adaptive capacity so that helps us build up a really good picture of well-being and its relationships with resilience 
And there's a simple kind of way we might think about this is, you know, combining three or four major metrics to do with environmental, economic and social well-being that we can then use to create an index and look at the change over time. But again, what I want to remind you is it's not just about response time. So understanding these metrics helps us understand kind of conceptualizing the system and to some extent helps you understand how the system has responded to change. But it doesn't help you understand that fully. You need the qualitative data and the more systems perspective to really understand which of these forms of well-being was being used to support these actions of kind of coping or adaptation. And it doesn't help you think at all about desirable futures. So that's why this is just one piece of the big puzzle. Uh, but like I said, there's some good overlap with kind of indicators of coping, adaptive and transformative capacity, which is helpful. And so usually we can integrate these ideas of well-being and the capacities for resilience into the same types of survey and interview tools. And the principles can then be integrated in as well. And that helps you come up with a, something like this, right, to summarise responding to change, that you're able to understand which actions people use to cope. If coping wasn't sufficient, what did they use to adapt? And if an, and neither of those was sufficient or transformation was intentional, what did they what did transformation look like? So this is an example from our urban work that, you know, if you're dealing with the kind of um, a short term lack of income, for example, that's affecting your food insecurity, you might rely on your family or friend networks. You might try and access emergency food system um, like SNAP or food banks, etc. If this becomes more prolonged, then what you might have to do is start changing your job, joining new groups, or a city might try and establish new policies, like in Flint, every kid in the school system gets a free lunch. Um, and, you know, if, if that really, you know, there's an intention there for a significant change, then you might leave. You might you go somewhere else to try and um, with a lower cost of living or so on and so forth. So this just helps us map out from the survey data and the interview data what the different types of responses are and what resources were used to support these um, responses to change. So then we get to this final piece, which is um, actually where we started in the Flint project, because we knew the system wasn't operating at a desirable level. And we wanted to find out from a range of stakeholders, diverse groups within the community, as well as policymakers and those involved in different uh, activities in the food system, what they thought the food system should look like. And that helped us develop um, values as priorities for the future food system, which we coded from a qualitative discussion of um, this is three big questions and there were multiple sub questions in the blue box. But, you know, what do you like about the current food system? What's worked well in the past or hasn't? And then what would you want to see in the future, basically? So this was published just a couple of months ago. Um, and I can share the link afterwards if needs be. And what it helped us do is is basically if we started at the, the visioning, then we were able to think about what resources we could find in conceptualizing the food system for how to move the food system towards those. And that was um, a really interesting process that I can talk about more actually, because I think we have some time. So this is just to summarize the operationalization piece that you know, you've got this split between resilience of what in the yellow boxes and to what for whom in the blue box, that you really want to build up a kind of thorough picture of your system, of your food system of interest, both from an ecological and a social perspective. We want to know what thriving looks like. So what are those well-being indicators? And then how do they change through different shocks? Um, and if you're trying to intentionally create change, you know, whose perspectives are you including is a really important question that helps you then think about who you're actually trying to create um, well-being improvements for. And like I said, this is a loop. So the hope is you're building long term relationships and being involved with folks who have a management role in a food system so that they can make these changes and you can help them understand the impacts they're having or not having over time. So I do have enough time, I think, just for the final five minutes to try and walk you through how we synthesize all this for Flint. And what I will say is that you will notice I do not have many publications that do the whole synthesis because it would be a book, not a paper. So um, the Flint project is a five year um, transdisciplinary project in Flint, Michigan. We um, were tasked to work with the Community for Regional, no, no, that's a different group, the <laughs> Community Foundation for Greater Flint and multiple different stakeholders that they brought together to think about leverage points to a more sustainable food system future. And we used a resilience lens to underlie this whole process. 
So the, the scale that we were given, which if you remember was question one, was pretty, um, spatial scale at least, was determined by our partners. It's actually slightly broader than the city of Flint and includes Beecher and Burton, which are two um, neighbouring areas. We were interested in the food system and particularly the city level governance scale. And we had this pretty long temporal scale, like I said, because, because participants wanted to look back to when Flint was thriving, particularly for its black community in the 1940s and then how that's changed over time and what we can learn from it. Going through kind of the conceptualizing the system phase allowed us to understand that, you know, this is an urban landscape with some urban agriculture, but mostly um, we're not looking at the production of food, more the distribution and retail and consumption of it. There are still some ecosystem services and we came up with a really rich list of actors from our stakeholder mapping. So we've got like a hundred and odd different nodes basically on our stakeholder map, but that the actions are pretty kind of consistently to do with retail and distribution of food. And then at the household level, it's consumption with a little bit of urban ag. And, and generally what we see kind of boiled down the structure function piece is that this is post-industrial city characterized by low food security. And the goal is to really improve that level of um, food security for those who are most marginalized within Flint. Now, taking this long term perspective allowed us to see that actually multiple most of the shocks that have influenced the city of Flint are not to do with even though they've had an impact on the food system outcomes, they're not food system shocks. So it's things like General Motors leaving the city which then influenced um, population dynamics within the city, which led to supermarkets leaving and going out to the suburbs, and also the water crisis, um, which is you know, an ongoing shock in the city of Flint. And what that this kind of compilation of those shocks on top of each other has meant is a real significant change in the retail and distribution of food in Flint, which has had influence on who is consuming what. And what's not an unusual kind of outcome, but what you see is that the costs are borne by the most marginalized communities, and any benefits go to external actors. But that we do see some differentiation within the community of, of whose um, food security has been affected in what ways. What we also found is that communities across Flint are actually demonstrating really high levels of kind of coping and, uh, and adaptive capacity. They're really great at utilizing the diversity they have within the communities, how connected they are, and how engaged and kind of participation, uh, how participation has been used um, incredibly impressively but they're really at the limits to resilience because they've been doing all of these actions particularly through the water crisis for five six years now and there still is no improvement in in food security and there's a high dependence on external um, sources of food such as those from food pantries so we use that to kind of do a more theoretical analysis of the regimes um, for resilience within flint understanding which shocks cause which regime shifts and how regime shifts kind of impacted different groups and such, which um, I can share afterwards if that's of interest. And then when we got to the visioning piece, which actually, like I said, is something we did pretty early on, we did 12 or so different workshops with kind of mostly with different groups from the community, but some with philanthropy and governance actors. And there was this list of um, 17 or so values that were common kind of across or not common across, but we, but came out of the an, an inductive analysis of that qualitative data. And what's interesting is that the majority of these are to do with social welfare, not food. And that just shows you how food systems are really important for the broader social ecological system as well. So what we've done is integrate this into further types of participatory modeling to now understand using our social structure from the stakeholder mapping, using the shocks we know about, using these values as a goal, how do you get to these? What leverage points will help you achieve these values and uh, for who? So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour as always, but what I wanna leave you with is this understanding that resilience is really important um, in, in how we think about managing our food systems, particularly because we know in the majority of food systems, we have marginalized groups and that we need to boost their well-being and levels of food security, as well as the resilience of the system overall. So that requires this understanding of heterogeneity and can influence your research design. But you also want to take a step back and look at this idea of well-being and thriving and understand what that looks like, what's the goal, because that can help you understand how both well-being and resilience will be experienced differently by different actors. And the hope is that by building up the kind of operationalization of this and more case studies of it, particularly in food systems, we can then build theory and practice that will help us uh, build resilience for the most marginalized in multiple other contexts around the world. So um, 
let me work out how to stop sharing my screen but that is what i have for you today and yeah any questions obviously we can do q a now or you can just email me afterwards jhodbod at msu.edu happy to answer any questions thank you so much jenny that was an incredible talk and it it oh, it was so inspiring um particularly what resonates with me is your ability to take this like complicated and, and um, rich theoretical concept and operationalize it and also to demonstrate, you know, it, best practices in terms of these long term, deeply embedded in place, inclusive yeah. sort of participatory projects. So I, I really appreciate your details on that. Um, oh. uh, yeah, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to jump into some questions that we're receiving okay. from the audience, if that's all right. Yeah. 